Good morning, Emmanuel Church. Our reading is taken from the book of Romans, and I'll be reading from chapter 3, verse 27, to chapter 4, verse 12. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God, who will justify the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works... Wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. This is the word of the Lord. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity now to come to your word. We thank you for the clarity and the power of your word. Oh Lord, won't you help us to understand it, uh, to be shaped and changed by it, and to submit ourselves under the lordship of Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen. And I've dropped a mic and spilt water, but there you go. <laughs> well, um, we're going to pick up uh, the reading in verse 13. So if you have a Bible, do open it up to uh, chapter 4 again, or follow along on the screen as we read the second part of, um, of chapter 4. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would uh, be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many many nations." He is our Father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him 
as righteousness. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, on who, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised uh, Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. One of the um, most ugly human qualities is pride. Pride never looks good on anybody. If somebody is proud or arrogant or boastful, it never is a good look, is it? Whether that's a sports person or a celebrity or a politician. Uh, just for a bit of fun, I thought, let me pull up a couple of uh, choice quotes from celebrities and let's see if you can identify who said these things. So here's the first one. I am the number one human being in music. That means any person that's living or breathing is number two. Anyone know who said that? Any guesses? Kanye West said that. Um, just for a bonus, uh, here's a little uh, a follow-up quote from Kanye West. My greatest pain in life is that I will never be able to see myself perform live. <laughs> here's another one. A lot of people don't like themselves, and I happen to be totally in love with myself. Who knows who said that? Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. Um, I love this one. I can't help but laugh at how perfect I am. <laughs> that was Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Ibrahimovic, I never say his surname right. And then here's one more, last one. Uh, see if you can get this one. This one's a bit easier. Sorry, losers and haters, but my IQ is one of the highest, and you all know it. Please don't feel so stupid or insecure. It's not your fault. <laughs> Anyone know who said that? Trump, Donald Trump, absolutely. That's a classic Trumpism. Now, I mean, we shake our heads and we kind of say how ridiculous these people are. But, but actually, pride runs so deep in all of us, if we're honest about it. Uh, one of the things sociologists have discovered is that most people overestimate their abilities. We think we're more sporty than we are. We think we're better at academics than we are. We think we're better looking than we are. Um, and it kind of is amusing sometimes. You know, you watch these, these music talent shows. And it's amusing, not for those who can sing, but for those who think they can sing. And they really don't know. Sometimes, of course, our overestimation of ourselves, our pride, can be dangerous. Like the old man who is convinced that he's a good driver. Or the lady who thinks that she's just on the verge of cracking that slot machine. Sometimes, of course, pride can be dangerous in our relationship with God. And that's what the book of Romans has been showing us. Because it shows that the real problem with our pride is actually in the way we overestimate our standing with God. We think we're fine with God. We think he must be happy with us. Because look at me, I'm not as bad as those people. And in fact, I'm quite a lot better than those people. And in a church like Rome, pride had actually caused these divisions among the people in the church. Because on the one hand, you had Jews who thought they were better than Gentiles. And on the other hand, you had Gentiles who also thought they were better than Jews. That's what pride does, isn't it? It breaks apart relationships. And so what Paul has been showing us in these first three chapters is how much worse we are than we think. And how much more uh, devastating that is. How much holier God is than we realize. And worse of all, how there is nothing that we can do to fix it. We can't do anything to put ourselves in the right with God. But the wonderful news of the gospel, of course, is that God has done everything to put us right with himself. That's what we've been looking at. God has done in Jesus what we couldn't do for ourselves. Jesus has, has offered his life in our place to deal with our guilt and to offer us his own righteousness. And all we do, all we bring to the table, as it were, is our faith. We just trust him. That's it. And so what Paul does now in this section is he teases out a bit more about what faith is. What does it look like? How does it work? And how does it show in the Christian life? And he'll show us that it's there at the beginning, it's there in the middle of the Christian life, and it's there as we look to the future. So we'll look at each of those three aspects of it uh, in, in course. Let's look firstly then at how faith is there at the beginning. It is faith. Faith is how God accepts us in the very beginning. That's the first part of this passage. We become Christians not because we, we've impressed God in some way, but purely because we've trusted in what he has done for us. And immediately, when you put it like that, it removes all grounds for pride or arrogance or boasting, doesn't it? Have a look at verse 27. Where then is boasting? I mean, that's the question. Where, how on earth can you boast? It's excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. 
For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now that word justified or to be justified, you might remember as a legal term, and it means to declare somebody innocent, to put them in the right. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, I got an SMS of a summons that has been issued against me. Yes, pastors get summonses too. <laughs> Somehow I'd missed a traffic fine or I'd forgot to pay a traffic fine, and uh, yes, pastors get traffic fines too. And it said that you have to pay 400 rand within the next seven days or legal action will be taken. And you get an SMS like that and you realize there is no way out of this. I can't tell them, it's okay, I'm a pastor. You know, please be nice. I can't write a sub story and tell them how sorry I was. The only option is I have to clear the guilt that is against me. I have to pay the 400 rand, which I did. You'll be pleased to know. And they, they declared me justified. In terms of the law, I am now not guilty anymore. That's what justification means. God has put us right with himself through what Jesus has done for us. The only difference, of course, between the fine and the story that, I'm, that God tells us is that he has done everything. We haven't done anything to make it happen. God has justified us apart from, verse 28 says, works of the law. And the way we benefit is by faith. Now the question is, who gets to benefit from that? Who gets to benefit from what God has done? And the incredible answer he gives here is anyone. Anyone. Verse 29. Is God the God of Jews only? Or is he the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith, that's the Jews, and the uncircumcised through that same faith. What God is offering is for anyone who will put their trust in Jesus. Jew or Gentile, whatever, whoever you are, it doesn't matter. We all get in the same way. We all come to God and are put right with him through faith. Now this was so important for this church because as I say, there were divisions. They were, they were at each other because they thought they were better than each other. I mean, isn't it the case that nearly all of our fighting and all of our quarreling really comes down to an issue of pride? We're unwilling to budge on our view that we are the ones who are right here. We're un unwilling to say that we're the ones who are sorry here. We're unwilling to admit that our viewpoint isn't the right one. Now, Paul says, wait a minute. When it comes to knowing God and being put right through Jesus Christ, no one has a leg up on anybody else. Nobody does. And so there is actually no grounds anymore for division or fighting because the gospel puts us all in an equal space before God. And the key thing to notice, and this is what he goes on to show, is that God has always worked this way with people. It's not as if this is a brand new way that God has suddenly opened up, you know, like a, a loophole. You get right with him through faith, where before, you know, there was a lot of work you had to do. If you were a Jewish uh, reader of Paul's letter, you might be thinking that, because didn't God require all these things of Israel? And Paul says no. And what he does is very clever. He says, let's look at the great hero of, of Israel. Let's look at Abraham. See, for Jews, Abraham was their spiritual father. He was the great hero of the Old Testament. When the world was a total mess, he was the one that God handpicked and chose to begin a restoration project. You know, he's the ultimate good guy in Jewish thinking. And Paul says, if you look at his story even, 2,000 years before he even writes this letter, Abraham was saved the same way we are. Have a look at verse 1 of chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, that last bit is a quotation from Genesis chapter 15. You might remember the Abraham story. I'd love for us to go and have a look at it, but we simply don't have time. But here is Abraham. He's minding his own business in the Middle East somewhere with his family, and God calls him and he says to him, Abraham, take your wife and go to a foreign land that I'm going to show you. Leave everything you know and go to the place that I'm going to show you. And I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. And most unbelievable of all, you in your old age are going to have not just a few children, but so many descendants that you won't even be able to count them. Now, the only problem is Abraham is 75. He's a pensioner. So is Sarah. But they, they can't have kids. They've never been able to have kids. You wouldn't blame him for being skeptical. But let's just read the account in Genesis 15, just two verses from that account. 
The Lord took Abraham outside and said, Look up at the sky, count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord, had faith, and he credited it to him as righteousness. See, Abraham didn't earn his way to God. God didn't handpick him because he had something going for him. No, the only uh, way in which Abraham was made right with God was by trusting in what God said. He took God at his word. And friends, that's exactly what faith is. You want to know what faith is? You want to define faith? It's taking God at his word. It's believing what God says. And when we do that, God looks at that and he says, that's enough for me. That's good enough for me. It's so hard for us to believe that this is the way in. I mean, it seems so easy. It seems too easy. Because we live in a world where you get nothing for nothing. Everything we get in this world is because we've earned it. Have a look at what he says in verse 4. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. In other words, he's saying, you know, you don't write to your HR department at the end of the month and say each month, oh, I'm so grateful that you paid my salary this month. Thank you for being so kind. And then next month you do the same thing. And the following month. Because your salary is an obligation. You've earned it. But when it comes to God, we have no one to thank but him. Because we haven't earned anything. Verse 5. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Can you see why pride is incompatible with faith? They don't live happily together because if you're trusting in God, you're putting your trust outside of yourself and you're putting your trust in someone else. And that, that's humbling. You know, if you're somebody who struggles with pride or you're somebody who struggles with interpersonal relationships because there's always conflict, I want to suggest to you that it could be the root cause as you haven't understood the humbling power of the gospel, of what Jesus has actually done for you and how he has brought you low so that he can raise you up again, not because of yourself but because of him. We start by faith. But secondly, notice, we also continue by faith. Faith is how God continues to relate to us. You know, people sometimes have this wrong impression of the Christian faith that we get in by faith. That's, that's a given. That's, that's understandable. But then surely we have to stay in by pulling our weight. Surely we have to earn our, way in, or earn our right to be there by doing good. And Paul says, no. No, if that were the case, we would all be in big trouble. And he uses uh, two examples to make the case. Firstly, he calls on another uh, Jewish heavyweight or another heavyweight from Jewish history. None other than King David. King David. Verse 6. David says the same thing. David says the same thing as what he's been explaining so far. And now if Abraham was the ultimate good guy, David was the ultimate fallen hero. Yes, of course, he was still a good guy, but I mean, that incident with Bathsheba. I mean, he had everything going for him. He was king of Israel. He had everything he could have wanted. He was successful. He was wise. God was giving him blessing at every point. And then... He saw Bathsheba, and he had to have her. And then the affair and the murder and the cover-up, it was a complete mess, wasn't it? Someone who had so much to look up to turned out to be just as bad as the worst of us. Now the question is, if you get in by faith, what happens if that happens? Is there any way back from that with God? You know, we might love the Lord most of the time, some of the time, but all of us mess up a lot of the time. And so this is an important question for us because even if we do want to do the right thing, we find ourselves over and over again messing up. Maybe not as spectacularly as David, but over and over and over again. Now, what does God do about that? Well, verse 6. David says the same thing. When he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those, and this is the quote from Psalm 32 that we read earlier. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Now he's almost certainly reflecting on the Bathsheba incident, the mess that all of that led to as he writes the psalm. And what a mess it was. He destroyed lives. He'd killed an innocent man. He'd brought shame on his household and his family. And the whole nation was now under the curse of destruction. If anyone deserved to be rejected by God, it was David. And yet David's God is the God who justifies the wicked. Verse 5. 
He doesn't justify good people or religious people. He justifies sinners, people who continue to struggle with sin, people who will continue to struggle with sin until the day they die. And he forgives them over and over and over again. I mean, verse 8 is just mind-blowing. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. I mean, that just, that just overwhelms me as I think about my own sin and the ways in which God has put up with me. I would have given up on me a long time ago. But God continues to love me and he continues to love you. What a thought. And that's not to say there were no consequences. There were consequences for David, serious consequences. The kingdom was taken from him. His family was torn apart. His son died. He suffered. But the one thing David did right is he returned to God in faith time and time again. He returned to God. He laid himself once again at God's feet and said, have mercy on me. And God is only too pleased to do that. So faith, it's the way God continues to relate to us. The second example that he gives here is he again brings up Abraham. And so if our bad moments can't downgrade our faith, like with David, what about our good moments? Maybe our especially good things that we do somehow upgrade our relationship with God, put us on a better level. And he says, no, no. And the the way to see this is to ask a very simple question of Abraham's story. Verse 9. Is this blessedness, the righteousness that David speaks about, is it only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? Now, just to follow along, this is a bit technical for a second, but it's important. Circumcision was a flashpoint between Jews and Gentiles for obvious reasons. And the Jews thought that circumcision in some way added to their relationship with God, kind of leveled them up a little bit in terms of how God related to them. And Paul says, no, let's, let's have a closer look at this. The simple question to ask is this. Was Abraham circumcised before or after God accepted him? That's the question. Because circumcision starts with Abraham. So was Abraham circumcised before God accepted him or after? And Paul says, you just have to read the story. And it's pretty clear. Abraham was circumcised way after he was accepted by God. God accepted him, and only much later did God institute circumcision. So whatever circumcision is there for, it's certainly not in some way to make God happier with, with the person who's circumcised. And this, the same is true, of course, for every other thing that we might turn to, to think that we can level up in our relationship with God. Whether that's you know, taking communion, or being baptized, or being part of a Bible study small group, whatever it is, any good thing you might want to do, is never going to improve your standing with God. And the reason for that, of course, is because nothing can possibly improve your standing with God if you put your trust in Jesus. God has done everything necessary to bring you as close as possible to himself. And now nothing can separate you from his love. What an incredible thought that is. And it's so freeing uh, if you struggle, as we all do from time to time, with doubt or with sin or with sadness. Right? We all struggle with these things. And what happens when we struggle with these things is we, we feel distant from God. We feel as if God has moved away from us. Or that it's, in some way we've jeopardized our relationship. And now, in order to get back, we have to jump through a whole lot of hoops to make God happy. And so we say, well, you know, my prayer life will get back on track once I've sorted my life out. And Paul says, no. No, God has done everything necessary to bring you to himself. And you cannot be closer than you already are in Jesus because of what he's done. Your feelings are lying to you. And you need to turn back to God even in your worst moments because he is there to welcome you back as that that father of the prodigal son with open arms. Now God continues to relate to us by faith, not in ourselves but in Jesus and in all that he has done. So God accepts us in the beginning by faith. God continues to relate to us in the present by faith. And thirdly, lastly, faith is how God sustains us as we look to the future. Now, there's a lot to say in this last section that we won't have time to look at. Go along uh, to your growth group this week. But the overall point is simply this, that Abraham's whole life was shaped by trusting in the promises that God had made to him as he looked to the future. Abraham's relationship with God wasn't about obedience to a set of laws, but by believing a set of promises. Look at verse 13. 
It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. In other words, God came to Abraham and said something. You're going to be a great nation. I'm going to give you offspring. And Abraham believed it. And that was the way, and that was how God uh, blessed him and poured out his blessing on him. And later on, when Abraham doubted, God came to him again and repeated those promises. And again, Abraham believed him. And so over and over again, we see Abraham's faith coming out here. And what Paul is saying is we've got to be like him. Verse 16, Abraham's the model for us. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. You see, friends, as we look to the future and the uncertainty of what lies ahead, God is calling us to be like Abraham and to trust that all that he has said to us and for us is true. Now, I'm not suggesting that's easy because God says some unbelievable things to us and he makes unbelievable promises to us that are sometimes really tough to believe, particularly if you're in a bad place at the moment. But just stop and think about Abraham's circumstances as well. I mean, God made that initial promise when Abraham was 75. And then there was 25 years of nothing, really. The occasional word from God, but 25 years is a long time and no children. Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is 90 before that child arrives. And in the interim, what does Abraham have to go on? All he has to go on is God's word to him. That's all he has. And that was enough. Verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as, he, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Friends, this is what faith is. Faith is believing that God will keep his word. That's faith. It's not a leap in the dark. It's not faith in faith. It's a confident assurance that God can be trusted. And the reason he can be trusted is because of who he is, not because of who we are. He's good for it. And he has been good for it, right? We've seen it throughout the whole history of, of the story of the Bible. We've seen it throughout our own story. You know, what the devil wants more than anything is for us to forget. You know, he wants us to say, what have you done for me lately? I know that you've done things in the past, but what have you done for me lately? No, friends, God is good for it. And so Abraham continued to trust in God's promises. Now, it's a bit kind of amusing. It says, without weakening, did not waver, was fully persuaded. Now, if, you, if you know the Abraham story, you know there were some serious wobbles along the way. I mean, twice he lied to the king of Pharaoh about who Sarah was, just to protect his own skin. He even tried to take things into his own hands and had a child by Hagar, his maidservant. I mean, that looks like a wobble to me. But what's encouraging about that is that the kind of faith God is calling us to have as we model our faith on what Abraham's faith was like isn't a perfect faith. It's not a faith that has no wobbles. It's a faith that persists. It's a faith that comes back to God after those wobbles and remembers that he has said things that we can trust. Now, this is so encouraging because, you know, we, I have faith as small as a mustard seed sometimes, as Jesus says. And, and he says that's enough. You know, some people say faith is like choosing to sit on a chair. You heard that illustration? Like putting your weight on this chair. That's a good, a good illustration. I prefer to think of faith as getting in an airplane. You know, the two types of people who fly in airplanes, the first type is the type that as soon as they hit that check-in point, they start to sweat, they start to shake, they start to panic, uh, they can hardly put one foot in front of the other, somehow they get themselves onto the plane, and then they hold on for dear life for the whole duration of the flight, eyes closed, praying as loudly as they was, as much as they could possibly pray, um, trying not to think at all about the fact that they're 20,000 meters in the air, or whatever it is. That's the one type. 
The second type, who often ends up sitting next to them, is the one who confidently strides through the checkout point, whistling as they go, orders a coffee on the way through, sits down in their chair, flicks on their Netflix, watches something, orders another drink, and enjoys the flight, relaxes the whole way. Now the question is, which of those two ends up at the destination? They both do. And so the important point is not the quality of your faith. It's the fact that it is in the right thing. You got onto the airplane, and you're going to get to the destination. Because it doesn't depend on you, it depends on the one who's taking you there. And so if you're feeling like your faith is wobbling, that's okay. That's okay. Because we have one who never wobbles, and we put our trust in him. And he's going to get you to the destination. He doesn't give you the roadmap ahead of time. He asks you to trust him. And he knows where he's going, he knows where he's taking you, and he knows how each step of the way is contributing towards the work he's doing in your life to make you more like Jesus. And one day, all the pain and the worry and the disappointment and the stress of this world will be gone forever. Do you believe that? See how the Christian life is faith from start to finish and at every point in between? Because when you discover this, it is completely humbling and totally liberating. It's humbling because you realize you, know, you, have, you have no leg up on anybody else. And it's liberating because you realize that you have now found true rest, no matter what comes your way. God has accepted you. And your sins, past, present, and future have been fully de- dealt with and paid for. Let's pray together. Lord, we admit that our faith often does wobble. We often find ourselves like the person that Jesus met who said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And so, Lord, for those of us today who may be struggling in our faith, struggling to really believe the promises that you've made, Lord, help us once again to fix our eyes on Jesus and all that he did for us, to trust that you are doing something that will result in us being made perfect in the end. And so, Lord, at each step of the way, help us to trust you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.